Good morning and a warm welcome to what? The welcome day, uh, a, a whole day of activities to kind of uh, orient uh, each of us uh, again uh, at, the, at the Institute. So first of all, I congratulate all of us uh, of being up here so early at 10 a.m. That's really uh, quite an achievement. Uh, the morning program, actually, I will give a, uh, uh, a brief talk, a uh, 45-minute talk about the, uh, the history and the mission of the Institute. It will be very impressionistic, will not be a scholarly presentation. Uh, in fact, uh, it's very easy for me to talk about the Institute to just switch me on, you know, and I'll go on for hours and hours. Uh, it will be the past, and then we'll have four short presentations from uh, faculty in each of the four schools about the present, the operation, and then we have a little panel discussion that I hope you will be involved, discussing perhaps also the future. Um, and then in the afternoon, there will be more logistical information, and I hope you uh, enjoy meeting a lot of the staff. And then we'll uh, close off in the best institute tradition with a very nice reception, which we, for the first time this year, will be uh, hold in the, uh, on the other side of Fold Hall, on the front lawn. So, uh, and uh, please, I hope you bring also your, your family uh, to that occasion. So, uh, I want to actually kind of uh, start by discussing where you are. Uh, you know, about you, I always like if I go visit the city, I like to have these maps to get a sense of orientation. Uh, now, for those uh, who are familiar with uh, particular uh, French or European uh, cartoon series, I often say, well, you're in a very small village in Gallia um, uh, uh, fighting the Roman Empire, and it's easy to imagine Caesar these days, I would say. Um, but um, the good thing of the Institute is that in some sense we have a founding document. And the founding document is a text uh, by the first director, Abram Flexner, that he published in October 1939 with a very catchy title, The Usefulness of Useless Knowledge. Uh, but actually it was a text, and I will tell you a little bit more about it, that ha he has been thinking for almost 20 years when it appeared. So uh, it was in some sense a blueprint, and uh, in fact we re, uh, reissued uh, with Princeton University Press this text last year, and I've been talking, I wrote an introduction, I've been talking about it, so I've been for the last year a little bit on my so-called useless book tour, and um, I had one golden idea when the book was published. I said, well, one of the great achievements of Flexner was of course to, as one of the first professors, to attract Albert Einstein to the Institute. He said, you know, after the appointment of Albert Einstein, we had 85 years of steady decline. Um, <laughs> and uh, so can't we get a quote of Einstein? And I look in the ultimate quotable Einstein, whether there's anything on Flexner. He must have known him well. And I was in luck. There was one quotation. I look it up very anxiously, and it said, Albert, uh, Abram Flexner, one of my few enemies. So this then I suppose wanted to have on the book. Albert Einstein, the book by one of my few enemies, I think it would have sold. Uh, but I actually want to tell you a little bit at the end why this particular quote, and I have somehow first-hand knowledge. Because over the summer I met this wonderful old gentleman, Dr. Joseph Schein, who was born in 1915. He's actually the uh, oldest living alum of Princeton University. He came as a freshman to Princeton in 1933. Abram Flexner became his mentor. Later, he actually became his patient. And so he, as an 18-year-old, was kind of present at the creation. He got to know Einstein. He got to know many of this kind of famous faculty of the 1930s. And he had some original observations that I will share with you at the very end. In fact, he introduced me also to uh, this gentleman in the, in the bottom, uh, uh, Dr. Charles Flexner, a medical doctor, who's the great-grandson of Flexner, actually the older brother of Flexner, so we also reconnected to the Flexner family. Many new stories. Who was Abraham Flexner? He uh, was born in a um, Jewish family, emigrant family in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, was very badly hurt by the crash of the 1870s, and because of uh, basically the hardship of his older brother Jacob, Flexner was able to study, and he went for to, uh, to Johns Hopkins University, one of the few uh, modern research universities in the 19th century. In fact, had very little money, so he went to the president and said, I can only afford two years. And it was fine. And he studied classics, and then he became a school teacher, uh, and became famous in the first year by failing the whole class, and landing in the new... So, academic rigor was with the Institute from the very beginning. Uh, in fact, three of the Flexner brothers became kind of famous. 
Simon Flexner was the medical doctor, first director of what's now called Rockefeller University. Bernard Flexner, a very important philanthropist, uh, diplomat, and Abram Flexner, the first director of the institute. Flexner rose to fame by, as the author of the so-called Flexner Report. It's an, a critical report on medical education that he, without any medical background, wrote, published in 1910. And I think we should, any of us who have ever done committee work, should introduce a unit for that, which I propose to be the Flexner. And if you achieve one milliflexner of a microflexner, you'll be lucky, because as a result of the report, roughly 90% of all medical schools were changed. I think 70% were actually closed. There were for-profit uh, institutions, uh, students uh, enrolled as 18-year-olds, uh, never saw a patient, there was no research, there was nothing. And he totally changed that through this uh, really scathing report. He called Chicago, for instance, the plague spot of the country. And from that moment he started and became a critical, a critical eye on American higher education. He wrote a famous book about universities where he extolled the, uh, basically the German, the European model, and criticized American institutions, this was in the early 1930s, about incredibly practically oriented. Here he is taking down Columbia University, uh, telling them that they are having these courses in practical poultry raising and beekeeping and home vegetable and fruit growing. This was the Depression days. And education was very much oriented towards the immediate and the practical, and I would say the useful. Now, all of this changed uh, in a dramatic way when he was visited by um, two uh, representatives of the Bamberger family. And the Bamberger family, in the end, were uh, Louis Bamberger and his, uh, his sister, uh, Mrs. Uh, Fould, uh, were able to give the first grant that actually established the Institute for Advanced Study. Uh, it's a remarkable story because they came to Flexner because they wanted to create, it, to create a medical school without any quota. In the 1930s, there were very strict quota, particularly Jewish quota in many universities. Prince University was one of the worst. Uh, and they wanted to have a place where there is no uh, bias of any kind. Flexner responded, well, that's all very fine. Uh, there already is such an institution. It's called Rockefeller. It's run by my brother. I have a much better idea. I want to create a place that's purely about thinking and research. He was inspired by the uh, colleges uh, of, of England, you know, All Souls College, the Collège de France in Paris, medieval institutions. And he felt that the United States needed an, 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 an institution of a similar caliber and a similar role. Now, the Bambergers, this, uh, the whole history of the Institute is uh, one of lucky survival. And, you know, luck has always kind of favored us, uh, as uh, Pasteur said, you know, luck favors the prepared mind. So I think Flexner was prepared for many years. But the Bambergers had a great department store, uh, and for those who are familiar with the Princeton environment, I think even in the 1960s, 70s, there were still Bamberger stores. A uh, huge store, it's still there in, uh, in Newark. They sold it to Macy's three weeks before the Wall Street crash. So in 1929, they were one of the very few Americans that have cash in their hands. In fact, they had one big tradition, which was the Thanksgiving parade, and that's still there. Those of you over here, over Thanksgiving, you will see the big parade of floating animals, uh, uh, Macy's Parade in, uh, in New York City. Um, so, Louis Bamberger had a very close companion, Felix Fuld was his business partner. He, uh, they were very dear friends. Uh, uh, Fuld uh, passed away and uh, he was married to his sister, Caroline Bamberger Fuld. And Bamberger and Fuld together created the Institute. You will find uh, now, we have Fooled Hall, but you will see that the Bamberger name is basically invisible at the Institute. So, from the very beginning, the, uh, this was kind of philanthropy that was not about the family, it was really about the institution. So, certainly, they, then they asked Flexner to direct this, he had his ideas, and he said to Flexner, well, you have been criticizing the world for many, many years, it's now time that people are able to criticize you, so could you actually lead this institution? So how do you start leading the institution? And just to bring you back to a different time, before there was faculty, before there were buildings, before there was even finances, um, Flexner thought that we needed something more important, which was a motto and a seal. 
So um, the first thing he did actually invent uh, the truth and beauty, uh, uh, famous uh, Keats quote, and uh, asked a, uh, an artist, Turin, to develop the seal. Very different, I think, from the present day where logos are, you know, corporate things that are brought, you know, to kind of spice up a brand or something. He felt that if he couldn't capture, uh, in some sense, the idea of the Institute in a simple image and a simple saying, it wouldn't be worthwhile. And, uh, of course, many of you will uh, perhaps spend this year wearing T-shirts with this. Now, when I, I was a, a member here and I remember when my children were growing up, they were still, uh, wore my institute t-shirt to soccer games and said, don't embarrass me, daddy, with these naked women on your... <laughs> <laughs> and of course, one of the uh, elementary questions is, you know, who of the two is beauty and who is truth? Uh, there are many institute folklores about truth and beauty. One of my favorites uh, is about the uh, mathematician Hermann Weil, a uh, famous mathematician that came in the 1930s, when he was asked, you know, what do you prefer, truth or beauty? He was very clever saying, my work always tried to unite the true with the beautiful, but I had to choose one or the other, I usually chose the beautiful. Uh, I must say, um, now in some sense, that we have uh, certainly put a lot of emphasis on the beauty of the research being done here. I must say, current political climate, I think, feels that, again, you know, it, it's, it's not a luxury to emphasize the truth component to what we do. The, uh, the original deed, said that the institute should be uh, in Newark or its vicinity. Now, I think we're all very lucky that the institute didn't end up in Newark, but ended up in Princeton. And this was the work of uh, what would actually would become the first professor at the institute, Oswald Veblen. Veblen was the chair of the mathematics department at Princeton and created, actually, in the, it was opened in 1930, Old Fine Hall, now Jones Hall, a grand mathematics department. Huge building. Uh, if you see the images of these uh, professors' offices, uh, large fireplaces, couches, and something, you know, terrific large apartment, actually built with the aid of the Rockefeller Foundation, that, and I will come back to that, created a second mathematics institute through philanthropy, which was the Mathematics Institute in Göttingen, Germany. So there are two wonderful large... This, in some sense, uh, math department was uh, much too large for the present faculty, and so it was an, op an ideal opportunity to house the Institute for Advanced Study. And Veblen actually, um, here you see some images of him, he was very uh, pressing to get uh, Flaxman to move to, uh, to, to Princeton. And you see in some of the correspondences that Flaxman writes back and he sends a map of New Jersey. He's, this is Newark, this is Princeton, this is the vicinity of Newark. Like, it's 60 miles uh, away, that doesn't work. Uh, but in the end, I think, uh, uh, Veblen was able to convince both Flexner and the Bambergers that this would be a good sense because actually having a wonderful university, a particular library next door, uh, would really help. Remarkably that, you know, in this ba uh, wonderful math department, there was already one of the fireplaces had an inscription by Einstein, actually in German. Uh, you know, subtle is the Lord, but not malicious. Uh, was already engraved in some sense in that, uh, in that building before the Institute or Einstein himself would come. Now, uh, Flexner was, of course, extremely successful in attracting Einstein. And it's a remarkable thing that Einstein actually decided to come to the Institute, but at that time existed only on paper. So you can ask, you know, why, uh, if all the major universities in the world attract, try to attract the most famous scientist of his time, why did he decide to come here? And, well, we can debate about it a long time, but it's good to know that, Flex, that uh, Einstein's position in Berlin at that point, he was both uh, kind of a special function at the Prussian Academy and he was director of the uh, Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for Theoretical Physics. It's good to know that that institute only consisted of one employee, namely Einstein himself. So he had some sense only a paper job. He was working at home and he was left alone. And I think that's what he felt were some of the outstanding qualities of the Institute for Advanced Study that attracted him. Uh, Flexen decided to start by recruiting mathematicians, and these are the first five mathematicians that were attracted. Uh, John von Neumann, famous, we'll tell a little bit more, uh, Hermann Weil, Veblen, as in some sense the first appointment, and James Alexander, uh, an, a mathematician who was then employed at Princeton University. Uh, very soon, uh, the other fields would come. 
Uh, here are some of the notes of these days. Uh, I like this one, particularly because today we have our kind of inaugurating ceremonies. This is the, uh, f the uh, minutes of the first faculty meeting uh, and uh, Flexen declared the institute to be open and the rest of us congratulate each other on the lack of formality attending this important occasion. <laughs> so I think that has been a, a crucial element at the institute for, uh, for, for all those years. Um, no, we try to keep kind of a low profile in the way things are operated. And um, no, uh, Flexner is kind of surprised that it works. Uh, he said, I frequently use the phrase paradise for scholars without any very distinct notion of just how a paradise would be created. What has happened is the following. They have great eminence, they're enjoying themselves, they have been turned loose in fine hall without any regulations whatsoever. The professors know, of course, what they want to do and are doing it. And so to his astonishment, it actually works. And um, they are, as he writes here, they are as happy as birds doing precisely the things that they always wanted to do. And I think that actually is the remarkable moment of success that Flexner realized he's working. He was always going on about this paradise of scholars. And one interesting phenomenon is that he was writing to the trustees, and one of the trustees was actually uh, Felix Frankfurter, the famer, famous um, Supreme Court Justice. And uh, whenever you got a message from Flexner, he writes here, news from paradise. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and he at some point asked uh, Flexner to kind of stop doing this. There's a wonderful quote here. Uh, For one thing, the natural history of paradise is none too encouraging as a precedent. <laughs> it was an excellent place for one person, but it was fatal even for two. <laughs> or at least for two when the snake entered. And the snake seems to be an early and congenial companion of man. So uh, there was also a sense of realism. And this was an institute that had to work and, and just glowing about paradise uh, was not enough. And that practical element came back in many moments. Very soon actually uh, after the mathematicians came, the first historians and social scientists came, because I think for Flex it was very important to realize that a place for independent critical thought, and particularly think about this in the 1930s, what's happening politically, what's happening economically or happened economically, it's very important to have this critical thinking. So this is in some sense the flow diagram uh, of the IS, only reconstructed in retrospect, but you see in the very beginning there was humanistic studies, there was economics and politics. Uh, by the way, here is uh, Hetty Goldman, so the uh, uh, first female faculty already in the, in the 1930s. Uh, economics and politics in some sense didn't work out as fine as people thought and they were finally merged with the humanistic studies into what's now called the School of Historical Studies. Uh, Mathematics in the 1930s also contained uh, theoretical physics, uh, to a large extent also uh, theoretical astrophysics, and the School of Natural Sciences was only split off in the 1960s. And I will say a, a little bit more about the School of Social Science that kind of was reborn in the late 60s, early 70s. Now, uh, Institute uh, at the very beginning, these are pictures of the, uh, the tea, afternoon tea, that was uh, served uh, uh, and already in 1934. Uh, it was uh, served in China. Now we have paper cups, but I'm thinking we think we, I think we are thinking going back into China. So it will be you know uh, a great uh, thing. And and so the traditions were set very early. Uh, and uh, Miss Weblem actually was very important for this. Uh, this I think I like. It's a, a quote from Flexner about his vision about the institute. His favorite word was plastic. And plastic in the 1930s meant something else than now, where it's cheap and rigid. Uh, it actually was flexible. And he said that it should always be both a haven for scholars and scientists, where they could regard the world as phenomena as a laboratory be without being carried off in the maelstrom of the immediate. Simple, comfortable, but it should always be adapting and, 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 and be able to, to respond to situations. Also, as I said from the very beginning, and this was the intention of the Bamberger family, that it was a place that didn't have bias in the words of the early 1930s. Uh, no account shall be taken directly or indirectly of race, religion, and sex. And I think actually one didn't realize in 1930 how important that message was. And of course, well, the big events that really colored the Institute were the events in Europe. And basically, uh, Hitler coming to power, April 1933, uh, basically 
making it impossible for Jewish and, and, and politically active scientists and scholars to be, uh, you know, they were in danger of their lives. And then there's this very intense debate between Flexner, between Veblen, between the board, what to do. Uh, one thing which is really remarkable is that last year there was a group of young, or, well, a group of visiting uh, members uh, in both in historical studies, social science and mathematics that felt very motivated to go back to our own history. And if you go to the dining hall, you see some of the, uh, the materials they curated. Um, I hope you, th there are wonderful articles in the Institute letter and uh, on our webpage. And it's very interesting to revisit, uh, I can't, won't be able to do it here very briefly, those days. Uh, Flexner wasn't convinced from the beginning that the Institute had a, play, had, had a place and did play a role in saving the scholars from Europe. At some point he even makes the remark, well, it's fine if you give me another hundred Einsteins. But then actually I think within a month, the very intense debate, it's clear that at that point the mission and the vision of the Institute certainly became a magnitude larger and that it had a role in the world. As Flexner originally said, this Institute was created to provide jobs for Americans. Actually that turned out not to be the reason why it is created and it had to live according to its own uh, principles. And that's rare. It's rare that you know, institutions hold themselves so dearly and close to their principles. The Institute has always done this. And so, uh, good, I won't go into the details, but please read it and, and see that you know, there is very important that uh, the Institute then kind of transformed itself to what I like to call an Ellis Island for scholars at risk. Uh, what happened is in fact that the uh, Abram Flexner together with his brothers and the Rockefeller Foundation were able to give very small grants to scholars in Europe that allow them to travel with a visa to the Institute and then from here they would kind of spread around the country. Uh, remarkable is that part of that effort was from the Rockefeller Foundation to dismantle the second mathematics institute they created, namely in Göttingen. Almost the whole math faculty of Göttingen moved to Princeton. There's the famous saying where the grand old man of Göttingen mathematics, David Hilbert, was asked by a Nazi functionary, how is mathematics in Göttingen? And he had to reply, there is no longer any mathematics in Göttingen. And so there was some hesitation with the Rockefeller Foundation to kind of destroy, so to say, their own investments. Uh, the, the point has been made that the Bamberger family in the department store uh, made his business with dealing with distressed merchandise and certainly there was a kind of a dealing in distressed colors. You, know, you can get geniuses at bargain prices and uh, it's remarkable to see these lists of small grants and how they were established. So Kurt Gödel, perhaps the greatest logician since Aristoteles, uh, $4,000, uh, somewhere I think is Stan Ulam, who uh, for a very small grant would come here. He would be crucial in actually uh, building the hydrogen bomb. So all of these played a very important role in America's, uh, well, both intellectual and security life. Um, then here is Flexner in May 1939. Uh, he's stepping down as director that year. And he says, 50 years from now, the historian Lupin Packard will, if we act with courage and imagination, report that during our time, the center of gravity shifted across the Atlantic to the United States. And many of these scholars came. Uh, for instance, Emmy Noether, perhaps the most, the most famous uh, female mathematician, a great, one of the great mathematicians uh, came here. Uh, Erwin Panofsky, the famous art historian. Uh, Kurt Goethe already mentioned many, many of them in that period. Wolfgang Pauli, the physicist who actually obtained his Nobel Prize in 1945 and he couldn't go to Stockholm, so actually the prize ceremony and even the award was done here at uh, in Fooled Hall. So lots of history. Uh, again, the Institute was meant to be an island of isolation. This is from the New York Times Magazine, 1941. I like the looming shadow of Einstein. Um, uh, but actually things worked uh, very differently. I, uh, in my introduction to uh, Flexner's essay, I write about the New York's World's Fair in 1939. Why? Because it was partly opened by a speech by Albert Einstein. So this was uh, uh, spring 39 and Einstein was able, to, uh, was asked to speak about the future, uh, also the future of science. He actually spoke about cosmic rays. In many ways, uh, his speech was a debacle, you know, the, the fuses blew and you know, it was not a great, great moment. But 
I actually pointed out that you know, he missed mentioning two things, nuclear physics and computers that would very rapidly change the world. In fact, uh, here he is with uh, Leo Zillard. Einstein Zillard, uh, only a few months later, in August 39, would write a famous letter to Roosevelt, essentially recommending the start of the Manhattan Project. Uh, when Flexner Sassay is published in October 39, the first meeting of that committee is actually held. Uh, here are von Neumann and Gödel. Von Neumann and Gödel created, with others, a uh, church at the university, many others, made Princeton the center of mathematical logic in the 1930s. And did that in a very natural way to the creation of the first modern programmable uh, computer. Uh, one of the achievements of the institute is the, uh, this kind of so-called von Neumann architecture computer that was built at the institute, first in the basement of Fould Hall, then in what's now the nursery school. Those of you who have children in the nursery school, it's a wonderful knowing that not only uh, your child takes their baby steps, but uh, computing took its baby steps uh, in the same place. And um, this was uh, incredibly important. And this is the first kind of engineer that worked with it, Julian Bigelow said, at the Institute in 1946, there were no tangible assets relevant to computer development, except books, brains, prestige, and high hopes. And I think this again shows, uh, and proves in some sense, Flexner's point of view, that the way in which scholarship and science is effective is often a very indirect way by asking deep questions and passionately believing in things. And there's a wonderful uh, history of computing at the Institute written by George Dyson, I highly recommend it, uh, uh, Freeman uh, Dyson's uh, oldest son. And here you see actually a picture of the, uh, the, uh, the staff that was there. At that point, there were almost 30 people employed at the Institute as software or hardware engineers. Um, it's remarkable that at the institution, this is the floor plan of Fould Hall in 1948, that this institution that was supposed to be as far removed from reality. Uh, at that time, you had Albert Einstein, father of the peace movement, John von Neumann, who was pushing very hard to develop the hydrogen bomb, and his game theory believed him that it would be best for America to strike first. And then here, uh, Robert Oppenheimer, at that point, uh, the institute's third director, of course, very much with an in-between position, and, and, and who would be incredibly hurt by the McCarthy area uh, that would come soon. Uh, by the way, this computer uh, worked on a 32 by 32 memory, so one kilobyte, uh, and very soon it was used by Van and others to branch out in many other fields. So, for instance, the Institute was responsible for the first electronic weather forecast, and I like to say my favorite line is that these days it took 48 hours to predict tomorrow's weather. So, a perfect post-diction uh, on this very, very small uh, memory, and it reached in many ways, and it's a remarkable uh, testimony how, you know, the foresight of research that von Neumann is asked to write for Fortune magazine in 1955 about can we survive technology. And he spends most of the article not about nuclear arms, but the fact about climate change and, in his word, how this will kind of merge each other's affair with those others more thoroughly than the threat of nuclear and any other war. Um, he, by the way, also gives advice how to deal with the, pro the problems of the world. And he says, they cannot be solved by a single prescription, only a reliance on day-to-day -day opportunistic measures, human qualities, patience, flexibility, intelligence. In fact, the first war effort for the Institute was not a computer, was not a bomb project. It was a group of historians that came together here under guidance of Edward Earl, mostly young German historians, uh, studying war history. And so there was remarkable, for instance, young historians like Felix Gilbert, who would be an institute professor uh, later. And so there were many efforts here. The institute therefore played, I think, a crucial role across the world. Uh, I like this. This was uh, the German newspaper, Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. I was visiting one day in Frankfurt, and I just noticed that there's a full page, the backside of the newspaper, about us. Uh, and it says it's an American renaissance. I think this became, in many ways, and I think that was Flexner's idea, that this is something like a Florence court, a place where scholars could meet and disciplines would be in conversation. Uh, I want to show you just a little clip of an interview with Edward Murrow, with uh, Robert Oppenheimer from 1955. I always thought this clip, I give it away, one thing away, 
was before Oppenheimer's hearing where he lost his security clearance and of course in many ways, uh, according to many, was a broken man. You will not see a broken man. In fact, this interview that was on live American television was in many ways uh, a means to kind of reinstate uh, his quality and his presence. So here he is in an um, interview with... This is See It Now, edited by the partnership of Murrow and Friendly, presented by the Aluminum Company of America. This is the computing machine at the Institute for Advanced Study, Princeton, New Jersey. It is virtually the only piece of scientific equipment at this institute. There is no student body here, just chalk and blackboard and books and scholars, less than 100 of them in all. Einstein, Bohr, Oppenheimer, Merritt, Woodward, Thompson, Lowe, Hetty Goldman, Kantorovic, Belop. In the past, the Institute has contributed much to the security and knowledge of this republic. The men of this Institute probe far beyond the existing frontier of man's knowledge. This is a brief report on the work and purpose of the Institute as seen through the eyes and mind of one man, its director, Dr. J. Robert Oppenheimer, a physicist. Dr. Oppenheimer, why don't we begin by uh, your telling me a little about this Institute for Advanced Study, how it began. Well, I, I'll, I'll try. Of course, it began at a time when I wasn't anywhere near. And uh, it's already a subject for historical research. I, I'm about to find someone to see if we can find out how it began. Uh, I've heard you describe it as a decompression chamber. Uh, well, it is for many people. Uh, there are no telephones ringing, and you don't have to go to committee meetings, and you don't have to meet classes. And the, it's especially for the few people who are here for life. The first years are quite, quite remarkable, because m most people depend on being interrupted <laughs> in order to live. <laughs> Let's stop here. You can find it on the website. Uh, if you hear it, it was a decompressing chamber and most of us depend on being interrupted to have happy lives. <laughs> so <laughs> be prepared. Um, of course, I mean, uh, in many ways, I think it's uh, the, the, the way the Institute at that point connected to uh, a political life is interesting. You know, I just a uh, few more highlights. Of course, George Kennan was appointed here as professor in the School of Historical Studies. It's remarkable because at that point you hadn't written any kind of book. You have written an 8,000 word telegram. Uh, but of course he became very much involved. In fact, during the war, uh, there was actually the part of the League of Nations was uh, here in Fuld Hall and uh, there were Soviet delegations and the Institute played an important role in, in merging uh, and, and play, played an important role uh, during the whole kind of Cold War and political issues. And that led, I think, you know, when the, the, uh, in the late 1960s and late 70s, the School of Social Science was established here. So these are some, where some of the first four professors. I'm very happy to see both John Scott and Michael Walzer around. Um, and I think this, the School of Science, Social Science, again, restored kind of a balance that was the very beginning. One of my favorite quotes of Einstein is that he said there were two things that he uh, was fascinated by, the physical universe outside and the moral universe inside. Uh, by the way, the establishment of the School of Social Science created a lot of internal troubles. I think I like the idea that, you know, uh, the bad days on Mount Olympus, the big shootout in Princeton, wasn't really clear to everybody this was a step forward, but I think we kind of survived. And, um, and, um, and now we have these four schools, and you will hear a little bit more later. Uh, just a, a few more things, so thinking about the Institute community. Now, the way I think about it, you know, we have our faculty, uh, you meet a few, uh, with not more than 30, uh, including, I think, uh, Emerita would be typically on the order of 50. There are you, the members and visitors, 250 this year altogether. There's the staff that you will meet during today. Uh, there are our trustees. The Institute is an independent institution. The so trustees played an important role here, guiding it and also supporting it. There are the friends, the local community. And, of course, there is uh, the alumni base, the AMIAS member, that you know, all of you will be part of it. An important other element of the Institute is our physical presence, and I want to finish, perhaps, say a few words. Uh, Flexner didn't believe in buildings. He felt that we should just ha have temporary uh, lodgings, but Veblen pressed him to actually create a physical place. 
the story is that the Veblen family uh, had to flee Norway because they lost all their land. And that from the very beginning, the family had, in, had this kind of uh, uh, image that you should buy, as Veblen said, no institution of higher education ever regretted to having too much land. So bought this almost 1,000 acre kind of olden farm where we're now based, to a large extent created most of it in terms of institute woods. And so that has given our physical presence the beautiful campus. The Fooled Hall was created in the late 30s. Here is the uh, dedication, it's still uh, partly in a construction project with, uh, here we see uh, Flexner, of course, uh, with Einstein again. Um, in fact, uh, this is the director's house. I hope some of you have been already visited. I hope you all have an opportunity to come and visit us. It's the original kind of farmhouse that the Oldens uh, created. It was created in the late 17th century as one of the five founding families of Princeton, a Quaker family that lived there till the 1930s. And so this farmhouse then became the director's residence. And I love the idea that in this many, many centuries, it only had two occupants, the Olden families and the Institute for Advanced Study. Uh, here you see Olden Farm, a very old map of Princeton. Uh, uh, the Quakers, by the way, picked Princeton because it was as far removed from both the, the vices of the, the two cities, Philadelphia and New York. And that's why we ended up just halfway, these two cities. Um, uh, here you see uh, one of the, the many kind of uh, uh, portraits, photo portraits of the Oppenheimer family and, uh, here in, in Olden Farm with, this, uh, with Kitty and, and, and the two children. Of course, this is... Uh, uh, I, I, my commute, and I hope you will, will have me here on the, on, the, on the front lawn uh, this afternoon. I like to say it's the most famous commute in the world because it's this, this famous line where Einstein and Gödel always walk. So whenever you walk between the trees, think about of, that you should have a conversation that is at least as deep as the one they had. <laughs> uh, the member housing was again a stroke of genius. Uh, it's, a, I think, a terrific quality of the Institute. It's uh, many other institutions are jealous. And again, it was Robert Oppenheimer's good taste that this should be built uh, not just as some sheds, but have a, a, a Bauhaus, famous Bauhaus architect, Marcel Breuer. You know, he, uh, built, he built, for instance, the old Whitney Museum in, in New York City. Um, also the famous Breuer chair that he's sitting in here. And uh, so the, the member housing was an integral part from the very beginning. Of course, we added some to it. And, uh, but it's uh, still very much, uh, very much high quality. Uh, the Institute Woods, I say, is remarkable. Um, I think it's just absolutely stunning to think that you have an institute for higher in education and, and research having a thousand acres and putting 90% aside by creating these woods, which are both a buffer, I think, against development, but also, I think, for all of us, a wonderful occasion to decompress. In the words of Oppenheimer, the Institute is a decompression chamber but I think this is a crucial element of the instrument. And uh, uh, the even uh, some of you might be amused to know that some of the farms that you see all the way to Quaker Bridge Road are on institute land. So the institute is a little bit like an old medieval castle. You know, it has farmers working for it. <laughs> uh, I must say the revenues of that are very, very limited. Uh, so if you want to become rich, don't, don't become a farmer. Um, and, but it has been an integral part of the Institute experience, I think. And uh, the Institute sold its developing rights away. So we are now, uh, although we still have to own it, we, ca we cannot use it anymore. And so for eternity, uh, those woods will be there for everybody to enjoy. If you walk across campus, you will see that there's a various styles of, uh, of our academic buildings. Um, and I think the Institute always picked uh, um, very s wonderful designs and great architects. For instance, the beautiful uh, Historical Studies Social Science Library was developed by Harrison, who also designed the, uh, the Kennedy Center in, the, um, in, uh, in Washington, D.C. Um, food was very important from the very beginning. The original dining hall was in the top floor of Fooled Hall. Uh, since then, it related to Simon's Hall where you see that you know, uh, our, our chefs are crucially important, Chef Michel that we have now. And uh, I think there was a short interlude when we had more ordinary cafeteria food. And I think this was the most serious crisis in the history of the Institute, I think, you know, we'll all survive. Then a lot of couleur, couleur locale around the Institute. I won't go on forever. We'll do this uh, 
over drinks. But for instance, you know, those of you who walk across Mercer Street will recognize this house. This is 112 Mercer Street. That's, of course, the famous house where Einstein lived. We think it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very special house because it's blessed or cursed in the sense that you know, uh, Einstein gave uh, the house after his, uh, in his will uh, to the Institute and um, basically for uh, academic residents. Since then, I think there have been two more faculty members that live there and including Einstein, uh, all three got the Nobel Prize. <laughs> so we think it's the closest to uh, a haunted house in academia. Uh, Einstein, of course, already had the Nobel Prize. Frank Wilczek had to leave the Institute in order to get the Nobel Prize. But Eric Maskin actually was a faculty member here when he received the Nobel Prize for economics. Uh, there always have been artists at the Institute. Um, I here a picture of David Lang, who is our current artist in residence, a famous composer. You will enjoy his, uh, his concerts. Uh, here's T.S. Eliot. The who actually wrote uh, The Cocktail Party, which is generally considered one of his worst plays uh, while being a, a visitor here. But he, again, uh, he was blessed because he received the Nobel Prize while he was at the Institute. Uh, I'm, they like this picture with the blackboard because every visitor then uh, got blackboards. And the question was, so uh, T.S. Eliot describes, is he's all of the mathematicians standing the whole day in front of the blackboard, so he felt he also should stand in front of the blackboard and write something very, very complicated. <laughs> so that's why this play is perhaps such a, uh, uh, had such a lack of success, because it was uh, incredibly convoluted. Uh, so that's just the, the, the wrong thing, I think, that blackboards irritate. Um, it's important to realize that there are many outreach activities you will see much more during the year. Now we have our public lectures, our after hour talks, short presentations where we share our research and our thinking. There are talks for families, there are concerts, conferences. We have outreach programs, both here. Uh, we have an outreach program in mathematics in Utah. There are summer schools uh, in, in all the fields. So there's lots of it to enjoy. In fact, if you look back at the history of, institute, of the Institute, I always have to think about the uh, the Red Queen in Alice. You know, uh, she makes this point that you know, it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. In many ways, the Institute hasn't changed. It has changed in the sense it has grown. You just noticed, in the, if you read or listen to the interview with Oppenheimer, you will hear him say it has just the right shape, 100 members. Now we are more than 200, and we still feel it's just the right size. Um, we have had change, but it always has been adiabatic change which is a physical term, say, that you move slow enough so that you always keep an equilibrium. And I think that has been the part. But I think we're extremely lucky that the founding idea of having a place that's you know, open for any way, that anybody can work on any subject, and that in some sense the creating forces of imagination and curiosity uh, are important to play a role here. And I want to finish by um, uh, two two citations from Einstein and Flexner, and also briefly come back to the different roles. Why were they somehow in a position? And this has to do also with, I think, the way the Institute relates to the world. And you will see some of that reflection back if you look at the historical documents. According to my spy, Dr. Schein, he, he observing the interaction between Flexner and Einstein, he said, well, Flexner very much, you see this in the correspondence, was a person who had a low profile. He felt that he wanted to create a place that was isolated, that didn't kind of reach out, that was like more introverted. Einstein had a different point of view as he, in his own, own words. He felt the world was interacting with him, so he had to interact with the world. Uh, when Einstein is on the boat from Belgium to Princeton, Flexen sends a cable saying, well, please keep a, po a low profile, don't make any political statements. Uh, when he arrives here, Roosevelt invites him to the White House and Flexner writes back, as you will understand, Professor uh, Einstein is a very important scientist. He's very busy. He doesn't have time for this. <laughs> Einstein noticed this, gets very upset, uh, gets himself re-invited, and makes sure he opens his own mail from that point of view. <laughs> uh, but that tension was always, uh, has always been, been there. Uh, I want to start with two quotes. First, by Einstein. You know, when he, uh, one of my favorite stories, when he was a young boy, he was giving a compass. And now everybody is amazed with the compass because the needle is always pointing north. But Einstein then describes that he moves with the compass through the room and he noticed that it's always pointing somewhere. There's something else, there's a magnetic field. 
outside in space that is kind of guiding him. And in some sense, you could see that, in a nutshell, his presentation, his, his key idea in physics. And so he had this incredible belief in imagination. And I like this quote, imagination is more important than knowledge, for knowledge is limited to all we know and understand. Well, imagination embraces the entire world, stimulating progress, giving birth to evolution, knowing what you don't know, seeing things that aren't there. I think that has been a crucial element for the Institute from the very, very beginning. The second, actually, quote I want to end with is the first paragraph of Flexner's essay. And I think it's very touching because it was, again, was written and published in October 39, where lots of stuff, so to say, was going on in the world, and there were many immediate concerns. And this is how Flexner introduces his essay. Is it not a curious fact that in a world steeped in irrational hatred, which threatens civilization itself, men and women, old and young, detach themselves wholly or partly from the angry current of daily life, devote themselves to the cultivation of beauty, to the extension of knowledge, to the cure of disease, to the amelioration of suffering, just as though fanatics were not simultaneously engaged in spreading pain, ugliness, and suffering. The world has always been a sorry and confused sort of place, yet poets and artists and scientists have ignored the factors that would, if attended to, paralyze them. And I think to have a place when you, we, can all attend to these, uh, to these kind of noble goals, a wonderful gift, uh, as I said, you know, uh, our history was one of uh, great luck and good circumstances, and, uh, and I think also a lot of uh, labor of love. I think you know, everybody who has contributed to this um, has, been, uh, has been incredibly, uh, incredibly powerful. So I hope this short presentation of the Institute's history and mission, uh, uh, that you enjoy that. And now I think I want to come to the next phase of the program. And so we'll have some short presentations by four faculty members about uh, the, uh, the schools, so the working of it. And then we will sit here with the five of us and we'll have some uh, debate and I hope also questions for you for all five of us. So I will just introduce uh, all speakers at once. So the first uh, speaker is uh, Scott Tremaine, astrophysicist, who will uh, give a core presentation of the School of Natural Sciences. Then Sabine Schmidke will talk, uh, uh, and she studies uh, the um, Islamic uh, thought uh, and the Middle East. She will give a presentation about the School of Historical Studies. Then Peter Sarnak, uh, all-round mathematician, I think, <laughs> uh, analyst, number theorist, geometer, uh, will give a presentation in the School of, Mathematical, uh, of Mathematics. And then finally, Didier Fassin, who just stepped in, very good. I uh, will give a talk about uh, the School of Social Science. So there will be just four short presentations and then we'll have a discussion. Thank you very much.